was um, and, and so Ludovic, um, well, he, he graduated from Munich. I got his PhD from TUM, and he was there also at a Max Planck Institute. I think it was a joint position. That's what it says on the website. Yeah, um, and, and currently, he is at the University of Oxford, a postdoc in a group of Gavin Salam, and he's working on collider physics um, and basically to describe collisions at well, at high energies at the LHC um, and to look at the Higgs boson and top quark physics. And he will tell us about his work there and about how to simulate collisions. And as far as I know, he's also applying for DECRA fellowship in Australia. Yeah, that's right. Not that right. Yeah. So, <laughs> Uh, let me share my screen. You want to share your slides? Yeah. Okay, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, perfect. perfect. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Please go ahead. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, first, let me say that it's a pleasure to be invited to this um, CPPC seminar series uh, to talk about my work. Um, so I will speak mainly about the use of button showers in high energy particle physics and um, about their accuracy. And in particular, I will focus on two elements that I worked on myself in Oxford, which is um, color, um, which is the subject of this first publication, and spin correlations, which is the subject of the next two papers, uh, one of which should come out um, next week, hopefully. Okay. So as you probably know, um, typically theoretical predictions for particle colliders um, like the LHC rely on complicated programs that are called Monte Carlo event generators. And I will take just one example of the success that the use of Monte Carlo generators has brought. So here's one plot from Atlas um, for a search for new physics, where Atlas identified hundreds of potential signal regions using data-driven approaches. And they compare the number of events that are measured with the number of events that are predicted from Monte Carlo simulations in each of these regions. And you see that the agreement is really good across basically all identified regions. And I know that there are many BFM people among you. So if you get bored, every time I speak of standard model accuracy, just pretend that I've said background for BSM searches implicitly. So how do these generators work? Well, these programs take full advantage of QCD factorization theorems, meaning that the energy scale of the hard process, the hard collision of the hardest particle, if you wish, is on average well separated from the energies of the subsequent quarks and gluons that are produced, um, which themselves have on average a higher energy than the final hadrons that uh, you pick up in your detector. And so because these different processes happen on different time scales, essentially, um, they can be more or less factorized. So at the core of the Monte Carlo generator, you have your hard matrix element for your process of interest, say in this case, e plus e minus 2z to q bar. Um, and this matrix element, you can compute perturbatively in an expansion of the couplings. So if you're only interested in QCD corrections, you expand in alpha S and you get your um, differential or inclusive cross-section at leading order, next to leading order, next to next, and so on. And once you've produced the first highly energetic particles, the Barton shower comes into action. Um, and the uh, primary energetic quarks will radiate gluons and further quarks. Um, until the energy goes down to typical hadronization scales, about a GeV or so. And the simulation of the emission pattern obeys some first principles of QCD. So because we know the divergence structure of QCD, um, we can basically construct an algorithm that will reproduce in some limits the actual true emission pattern. And what these Barton showers do is effectively they resum large logarithms coming from QCD divergences up to a certain order, which is the so-called logarithmic order. And at the very end, once the shower cutoff has been reached, the partons that were produced hadronize and they combine into the actual particles that um, enter your detector. So kaons, protons, pions, etc. So what's the issue with these programs then? Um, well, if you just think like an experimentalist, the issue is that there are some differences in practice between the results of different Barton shower programs. So, for example, um, you see here from the CMS plots, the simulated jet response, which is, which is basically the difference between a quark and a gluon jet. And you see that predictions differ between two of the shower programs, one which is Pythia and one which is Helvig. And this ultimately leads to an uncertainty on 
another quantity, which is called the jet energy scale factor that these experiments apply, where you see the atlas plot here. Um, and the jet flavor uh, uncertainty translates into this green line here. And you see that this is small, but not negligible. It's about 2 to 2.5 percent. And where does this difference come from, really? Well, Barton showers themselves rely on certain approximations. And very much like the hard matrix element, which is defined in an expansion up to some order, leading order, next leading order, Barton showers are also defined by their um, resummation accuracy, which we call leading log, next to leading log, etc. And while showers will in general agree at leading log level, so for the first set of terms, the subleading terms might well differ. Now, there has been a huge progress in the last 40 years in computing corrections to the matrix element at higher order. So you have, for example, three loop corrections for a whole range of two to two processes, and now some two to three processes even. But this is not quite enough because in some cases, um, large logarithms that come from soft and collinear diverg divergences in QCD can spoil the convergence of this expansion and they can do so quite badly. So there also people have put themselves to the task of computing so-called matched calculations where you resum on top of uh, your fixed order prediction. And for example, um, the Higgs cross section now has been computed to n cube below match to an n cube LL resummation. So these calculations are really impressive. Um, but the issue is that while they are very impressive, it's an enormous effort to get a matched calculation for even one process or one observable in a given process. And so typically experimentalists tend to still rely mostly on Monte Carlo generators because they are an automated way of getting a fully exclusive event, fully exclusive final state, which they can feed to the detector simulation. And um, well, what's the issue then? So Barton showers, while being very versatile, are actually much behind in, uh, in a formal sense, in logarithmic accuracy. So most Barton shower programs on the market are formally only leading log accurate, so LL. And so there is quite a big discrepancy between the state of the art dedicated calculations that are out there and the accuracy of Barton showers, which are the most widely used tools um, and which actually provides the final theoretical predictions for um, 80 to 90% of experimental analysis. Um, so in the last few years, people have redoubled their efforts in order to design better showers. I think we're currently on the brink of, if not already beyond, a breakthrough. And typically the band scale showers, which is the collaboration of which I am a part, um, for example, have been demonstrated to achieve next to leading log accuracy for quite a large set of observables. So these are final state pattern showers. So not proton proton, and they're not public yet, but we're getting there. And so my main point in setting this in context is that um, Barton showers are currently the bottleneck for some experimental analyzers, but they are also at a bottleneck, theoretically. So how do um, these Barton showers work? I'll gloss over it, but you should get a, a broad idea of how they work. Um, so there are some exceptions, but most Barton showers on the market are based on a framework that was proposed quite long ago by Gustafsson and Peterson, uh, which is called the dipole picture. So how do you determine the probability of emitting a new particle? And how do you determine the kinematics? Well, an easy way to think about this is to imagine that an event is just an ensemble of connected color dipoles. So each quark is the color end of a dipole, each antiquark is the anticolor end, and then each gluon belongs to two dipoles, and it's both the color end of one dipole and the anticolor end of another. So imagine that you start from a QQ bar event, say e plus e minus to z to QQ bar. So at this point, you have only one dipole, a Q bar Q dipole, with an energy scale V0 that is uh, equal to the collision center of mass energy. And as it turns out, that dipole obeys an evolution equation that gives you the probability of radiating or not radiating another colored particle at the lower scale. And so effectively, iteratively for each emission, the algorithm samples the scale of the next emission according to that distribution. And it chooses a value V1 at which one of the dipoles in your ensemble splits. So in that case, the red dipole splits, and you get a new dipole, a green dipole, um, at a scale V1. And it does so iteratively down to some cutoff, which is uh, taken to be at, of the order of the hadronization scale, at which point the shower stops. 
So the main message that you need to take away here is that all of this formalism works very well, but it works in a planar approximation. So every color dipole evolves basically separately from each other. Or in other words, the emission pattern at any point of the shower is taken as the incoherent sum of individual dipoles. And this is called the large NC limit, NC for the number of colors. So each of these dipoles have formally a different color. So they're not bounded by three. So for those of you who compute high loop corrections, for example, this is usually called the planar limit. And so it makes things easy because you don't need to you know, sum over uh, contractions of color indices or anything. Um, but um, as we will see, it is quite important to include subleading color effects in part and Right, so just to make, to make this completely clear. So for most observables, these bad logarithms that spoil the convergence of the series can be resummed. And typically observables take them this form once you resum these logarithms. They, they, they are said to exponentiate because these logarithms appear in, the, in an exponent. And the current status is that most Spartan showers are leading log accurate. So they reproduce correctly this set of terms, but not necessarily the others. Um, they might be NLL accurate in some cases, but uh, certainly not every case. And as I arrived in Oxford, uh, the Panscale collaboration had uh, basically written a couple of criteria to be able to claim a certain accuracy for a pattern shower algorithm. Um, and at that point, they had also designed a family of showers, which are called the Panscale showers which were demonstrated to be NLL accurate according to these criteria. So NLL accurate, but not quite. So um, they were NLL accurate again in the large NC limit. Um, so up to subleading corner, which are terms um, that are next to leading logs, so belonging to this set of, of terms, but suppressed by a factor of one over NC squared. And in the finite NC limit, this factor is a factor of one over nine. So. And they didn't have spin correlations, which, as I will explain later, is also an effect that appears at next to leading log. So this is what I've been working on mostly in the Panscale's collaboration. So let me start with sublimin color then. Um, and before I move on, let me just explain this type of diagrams because uh, I will use them a lot. And they're called Lund diagrams. So these diagrams are very closely related to how the showers operate. Um, and they're a way of representing a shower event, or basically they're a way of representing the phase space that is available for potential emissions, which also makes it easier to understand where logarithms come from in the end. So we represent the emission structure um, as a function of two coordinates, which are each associated with a potential source of logarithmic divergence. So in this case, we choose the log of a uh, transverse momentum scale, uh, here the log of KT, and the log of an opening angle one over delta. So roughly said, soft emissions are at the bottom of this plane, and collinear emissions are on the right of this plane. And if you take these examples, you, might, you will understand basically how these work. So if you have an event, say, where a quark emits a gluon B and then emits another gluon C, the phase space for emissions that is associated to the quark is this big gray lone triangle, which is called a primary lone plane. And then the emission B is represented as a point on this lone plane, and it has a KT and an opening angle with respect to the parent A. And emission C is also represented as a point on this lone plane. And each of these is associated with its own lone leaf. So where emissions can happen from B and C later on, on these secondary leaves. And if you compare that to the right uh, plane, you see that uh, here the gluon B is emitting C. And so C appears as a point on the second lone leaf, and it's associated with a what you'd call a tertiary plane, tertiary leaf associated to C. Okay, so what's the issue with color then? Um, well, in typical showers, the color factor, so either CF or CA, is basically put back by hand into the shower in the following way. So what one does is that one would look at the dipole end that is identified as the emitter, and if it's a quark, you apply a factor CF to the emission rate. And if it's a gluon, you apply a factor CA. And this is very simple. Um, but it was shown actually by some of my collaborators that this color factor assignment will lead to the wrong full color terms already at leading log 
level for certain observables like the thrust. So here, for example, you see again this lone plane. And if you imagine that you have one gluon emission that lands here on the lone plane associated with its own leaf, um, the plot on the left shows what color factor would be applied for a potential second emission depending on where it lands. And you see that it, it, it applies a factor CA in this blue region here, and it applies a factor CF in everything that is in gray. And this is not the correct radiation pattern. And the lunar plane makes it very easy to understand what's the correct radiation pattern. And it's shown on the right here. So basically, everything that is emitted from a quark, or that lands on the primary lunar plane, rather, should have a factor CF. And everything that lands on the secondary lunar leaf associated with a gluon should have a factor CA. So the goal is going to be to correct this, to arrive to this. Um, so this wrong, um, naive color factor um, assignment scheme, I will call CFFE in the following for color factor from emitter. And as I said, we'll try to come up with something, something more sophisticated. So very basically, the starting point of our algorithm is the following observation. Um, so at leading log, what color factor you choose is dictated by angular ordering arguments, if you remember your QFT courses. And so for a configuration like this one, uh, with a radiated gluon emitted at an angle theta, what one should do is that one should draw a cone of opening angle theta around the closest dipole end, and then just count the net number of quarks that are contained in that cone. So if it's one, the correct color factor is a CF, and if it's zero, the correct color factor is a CA. And this will reproduce uh, basically what's shown on the right here. So our algorithm, or like basically one of the solutions that we implemented, um, is quite simple. Um, so as we learned from angular ordering, the only thing you need to keep track of as the shower evolves are the angles or equivalently rapidities of successive branchings in the chain. And so on top of a list of dipoles and their four momenta, um, four momenta of their constituents, at each point of the shower, we also keep track of a list of what we call segments, which is this guy here. So each segment is a succession of intervals in rapidity, and each of these intervals is associated with either a CF or a CA factor. So I'll go quite quickly over it because it's relatively easy, easy to understand without going into details. If you start from a Q bar Q dipole, um, you initialize a segment that is associated with that dipole, which is just a full interval in rapidity from minus infinity to infinity. And it's just one overall CF factor everywhere. So the lone plane on the left shows the, the phase space available for the next emission. And the dashed line at the bottom indicates that a factor CF should be applied everywhere. Now, let's imagine that I do one emission, which is a gluon G1 that the shower decides to place here on the primary lone plane. So what you would do then, quite simply, is to look up the rapidity of this gluon at a G1 um, in the segment corresponding to the emitting dipole, which is your QQ bar dipole. And in that case, it lands trivially on CF, so that's the factor you would apply. Then the rest of the shower um, works as is. So you'd perform the kinematics of your emission, you'd add a gluon G1 to the event, and the lone picture at that point is that one on the left, with, with a secondary lone leaf stretching from the gluon G1. But of course, you'd need to update the segment. And this, this goes like this. So the Q bar Q dipole gets split to a Q bar G1 and a G1 Q dipole. And what you would do very simply is to record the rapidity of this first gluon, G1, and insert it into the list. So the first segment for the Q bar G1 dipole is now a CF factor for rapidities between minus infinity and eta G1, and then a CA between eta G1 and infinity, and equivalently for the other dipole. So keeping this list allows you to basically apply the correct color factor at any time in the shower, at leading log. And you'd repeat that for any other emission that lands on your lone plane. So this scheme, this solution that we introduced, I will call segments in the following. And I will show you comparisons, basically, to uh, dedicated resummations. So how do we validate things in band scales? This is actually quite a, uh, an ordeal. So our philosophy of accuracy is the following. So the showers should reproduce the exact matrix elements in certain limits, so for soft and collinear limits, basically. Um, that's fixed. That's what we call fixed order tests. Um, but it should also reproduce 
known dedicated resummations, whether they are analytic or uh, numerical, um, in a certain limit. And I won't go into too many details here, but I will show you the, the plots and I'm happy to discuss in the, in the questions bit. So for color, I am going to show you uh, what happens if we look at global event shapes, for example, which are types of observables. Um, and the results are shown here. The only thing that you need to understand is that a green point, so basically a green point at zero, shows agreement um, with a certain shower for a certain observable at leading log and at full color. And so typically with this naive method of assigning color factors, this CFFE method, you see that for all showers, you have certain observables which are not reproduced correctly at full color um, for a certain combination of shower and observable. So what happens if we enable um, our segment method now in the showers? And the result is obvious. So every point is green. So for all the observables that we looked at, for example, all showers agree at full color at leading log. So not only the band-scale showers, but also some um, more uh, widely used showers like PFI8. So I won't show you other results, but I'm again happy to show them. I have them in the back. What is the second missing bit um, in band scales? Well, at the time I arrived, it was uh, spin correlations also. So um, to claim full NLL accuracy, you better have spin correlations, um, as I will explain. And usually pattern showers don't care too much about spin. So the helicity of radiated particles doesn't matter. A lot of pattern showers effectively take the average over helicities. But again, there are several reasons to include them. Um, first one is that they appear formally at next to leading log. So if you want to claim full next to leading log accuracy, it's not really an option to neglect them. Second, they are easy to implement. Um, and third, they can actually be observed. So they're important in certain analyzers, which probe spin. So what are these spin correlations? Well, for splittings that are collinear, the matrix element factorizes in the following way. So you, ha you have to sum over repeated spin indices, and this gives um, basically a final rate, a final cross-section that is proportional to 1 plus some factor times the cosine of 2 phi, where phi is the azimuthal angle between the splitting planes 0, 1, 2, and 2, 3, 4. So if you have a gluon 2 that splits collinearly to a, a quark pair, for example, 3, 4, the azimuthal angles of the splitting planes will be correlated. And this is an effect that comes from the spin of the gluon. So again, typically Barton showers use helicity averaged splitting functions. And so the spin information is simply not propagated. But of course, one doesn't want to redo all these spin uh, contractions at every point of the shower, every time a, a Barton is emitted. But as shown by Collins and I think by Knowles um, long, long ago, one can devise a simple algorithm that reintroduces the correct azimuthal dependence in a limited number of operations. And I won't go into the details of the algorithm and how we implemented them, um, but um, I'm happy to discuss as well uh, during questions. So one point of our publication was to introduce a simple formalism to, um, to implement this collins knowles algorithm efficiently. And this was relatively straightforward, but it was less straightforward to check that the implementation actually reproduced next to leading log observables. So while preparing our paper, we, um, we had modified existing resummation codes to include spin correlations so that we could compare it to our showers. But we were kind of bummed out that there were no external resummed calculation out there uh, of some observable that was sensitive to spin because cross-checking externally is always better than internally. And we were quite lucky in a sense, because as we were writing the drafts, uh, one calculation came out by uh, Chen, Mold, and Zhu um, of this observable, which is called the three-point energy-energy correlator, which we were able to use to um, basically test our implementation. So this observable is given here, and it's not quite important uh, to understand how it's defined. What is important is that uh, it is sensitive to spin correlations. So here you see the result of a resummation. Um, the magenta curve is the analytic resummation by Chen Mo-Ju. And the blue points are our own numerical resummation tool, which we call the toy shower. And you see exactly this one plus 
a factor cosine two phi uh, dependence here. And you also see that our toy shower agrees perfectly with the analytic results, which was a way of um, basically validating our toy shower. Um, but in the meantime, we had already devised that observable that was sensitive to spin correlations, which we call delta psi one two. And again, it's not important to understand how it's constructed, but it's inspired by the lone plane picture. And as you will see, it is sensitive to spin correlations. And the question was whether our observable was more sensitive to spin correlations than this EEEC, and also to see whether uh, we were able to resum it. And the final plots uh, are shown here. You see our delta psi one two observable and the EEEC on the bottom um, for several band scale showers and for the toy shower. So you don't see the toy shower because it lies exactly underneath the points. So this was a way of, first of all, validating our results, our implementation in our showers. And second of all, making a statement about some interesting phenomenology. Um, and you see by eye that this delta psi one two observable is relatively more sensitive to spin correlations than the EEEC. And actually, as we um, as we were writing the drafts, we made also the point that this observable has certain parameters which you can tune in order to uh, optimize the amount of spin correlations that uh, seeps through to your final observable. So there is interesting phenomenology associated with it, and one could try and measure it at the LHC, for example. And in my last 20 seconds, I will just uh, flash results that are going to come out in the paper next week. Um, and that's associated with spin correlations that are not um, uh, between two successive collinear splittings, but rather in configurations like this one, where you have one soft gluon that is not necessarily collinear to the quarks, that then splits collinearly. And basically, our, our implementation of the Collins nodes algorithm cannot address this type of uh, configurations straightforwardly. And what we've been doing is uh, basically correct it with so-called soft corrections so that you get the correct uh, emission pattern and spin correlations also for this type of configurations. And actually, this was the last ingredient to claim um, full NLL accuracy in leading color for our massless final stage hours. So this is going to come out next week. All right, I'll just leave my um, summary slides for you to read, and I hope that the main message got through. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ludovic. Um, we have time for questions. Ludovic, thanks for, for, for maybe I'll go with the first question, if it's okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, can you elaborate about the phenomenology you mentioned? Interesting. Um, which is sensitive to, to the analysis. Right. Um, so do you mean about spin correlations? That, that's right, yes. Yeah. Um, so I think for, I think it's simpler to explain in terms of our observable. Um, and basically what we do is that, imagine you have a jet that's produced at LHC, high energy jet. Um, what we do is that we first reproduce the lone plane picture of that jet by doing the standard steps that are presented in this paper. So we decluster the jets and try to understand which parton would be clustered with which parton to reproduce this lone plane picture. Um, and then what we do is that we go through this lone plane and identify the, the first primary um, plane, so which would be, for example, this gluon G1 here. Um, and then on that plane, identify the first secondary that pops up, which would be this QT partner here. And so this is a way of defining at all orders the equivalence of what I've been showing here. Because at all orders, you want your observable to be infrared safe, and this is complicated, but this is what this observable achieves. And so then you would just compute the difference in azimuthal angle between that plane, secondary plane, and that primary plane. Um, and so in a way, having a jet and applying this declustering would give you um, a way of defining an observable that is infrared safe that is associated with spin correlations. So you could just go ahead at the LHC, take one jet, apply this procedure, and this should give you something that's, um, that has this cosine modulation. So in some sense, it's a, it's a fully quantum mechanical effect, right? Because it comes from spin. And it would be interested, interesting to, to observe it at the LHC. Um, and 
well, to compare it to a resummation, really. And this has never been done, I think. And um, I think there is some renewed interest right now uh, for screen correlations, but uh, I guess it's an analysis that's simple enough to do. So we there, there is a lot that we haven't uh, said in our paper because this is not a full study. Um, all these quarks are massless, you don't have hadronization and so on and so on. So it would be interesting to have a real phenomenological study to see if it's feasible and if you would really uh, in practice see these spin correlations um, for the statistics that you have at the LHC, for example. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, other questions? Maybe I can ask, you, you mentioned before that, that next to leading log uh, is that we are on the verge of getting there, but not, not there completely yet. So, so you mentioned that the soft emission, that that's one issue. So, so basically, when could I basically run a collider simulation there with the full next leading log accuracy? Yeah, this is a complicated question. So um, this bit uh, was the very last missing bit that we uh, that we needed in pan scales for having a final state shower at next leading log accuracy. So uh, in the sense that uh, um, it would be applicable to E plus E minus collisions, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the very, very next step is to have a shower that actually includes initial state radiation so that you would be able to apply it for proton-proton uh, -proton collisions. Mm -hmm. And this is actually something that my collaborators have been working on. And I think they're quite close to having a working code at next to leading log for uh, initial state radiation as well. Um, and then the, the next bit is to make the code public, of course, and um, also to make it usable in a real Monte Carlo, which means a lot of nitty gritty details. Like you need to be able to apply your hadronization model at the end and uh, connect it to the, the hard matrix elements and uh, matching uh, issues involved and so on. So I think it's not quite there yet, but it's getting there. Like in, in principle, the, the, the proof of principle is done, basically. Mm -hmm. I think that's good. That's promising. So in how, how much, what's the gain in precision? So, so can you say, is it uh, at what level? So was it was 2% there roughly? Right, so it's a level, yeah, it's at the level of a couple of percent, um, mm -hmm. which is, which doesn't seem huge, but it can be, especially if you think in terms of, for example, all the machine learning that is applied on Monte Carlo simulations at the moment, like for the mm -hmm. tagging and stuff like this. Um, you really want to have a precise prediction because your machine learning algorithm is definitely going to um, uh, learn from from uh, from your simulation, and you have to be sure you have to make sure that the effects that are there are genuine and not uh, and not spurious. Um, and at the moment, if you think uh, just purely in terms of experimental uncertainties, um, partial uncertainties are in some cases, the leading uncertainties. So you really want to go to next to leading log and to include these uh, subleading color effects and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. oh, that sounds good, that's interesting. So Peter has a question. Right, you're muted. Yep, uh, it's more like a comment in response to your question also, like what do you get for for these improvements? Ah, you get a couple of percent improvement. Again, maybe it doesn't sound that impressive, but. One of the things that you get when you go from leading order to next to leading order, or in this context, leading log to next to leading log, you don't just get a better like central prediction or a better central answer. You also, for the first time, get a reliable uncertainty estimate. And that is absolutely crucial for, for high precision applications. Right now, we have these leading log showers, which we can kind of get to agree with a lot of collider data by tuning them and twisting things and building in improvements. It's, been a long process over decades. So they're actually most of the time doing better than they have any right to. But that's because we've been doing finessing on them for many, many years. But that also makes it really hard to give you an exhaustive and reliable and trustworthy uncertainty figure. Because if we just did a straight up honest uncertainty estimation, it would be huge. But we know that they're actually better, but how much? So it's very hard to estimate reliable uncertainties with the tools that we have right now. Once you get to next to leading log, you gain a much better understanding of the uncertainty that you have on the calculation. Mm -hmm. oh, that's a good point, yeah. thanks. And um, if I may also, so one of the important points is also that um, 
going in higher um, to, to a higher logarithmic order actually forces us to rethink Barton showers. Uh, because right now we can get away with uh, what we have uh, up to next to leading log and maybe up to next to next to leading log, but it it poses the question whether you know uh, the fundamental ideas are definite answer or not basically, uh, and this is a more of a, an interesting theoretical problem really. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Um, any last question? I think we exhausted all our questions. So thank you very much, Ludovic, thank you. for a very nice talk and um, answering all our questions.